keep notes about these leads. That's where we define why they were rated an A. Don't create ratings like A dash interested because blah, 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 A dash this, or hot because blah, blah, blah. No, the ratings need to be very simple, something that you can build reports on. How many of these do I have? How many of that? How many hots? How many colds, etc. And then when someone drills in, they're actually going to make a contact. They can see why that person was rated the way they were. Think about it. If you could only keep five leads right now, if you had to delete your whole database and you can only keep five of them, which ones would you keep? If you don't have a rating system, you'll probably have to go through each one of these one by one. Don't do that. What's a trick? Now, the biggest rebuttal I get when I explain this to people is they say, well, John, if uh, I only speak to somebody once, how would I rate that lead? You know, I don't really know that much about them yet. It was just a very quick call, uh, phone call or they dropped by and I didn't have a lot of information. Well, the tip I would say is this. How did they contact you? That tells you how hot they are. If they walked in, they're hot. If they called you, they're hot. If they're kicking tires on your website and, and, and filling out a web form, okay, you know, warm to cold, depending. Another thing is, what is your success rate in enrolling students in the program they are most likely interested in? If in your community, your children's program is, you know, top notch, everybody talks well about it, and they called you, that's hot. It's a program you're likely to sign them up in, and they're expressing interest through a phone call, which today is a rarity, and usually it indicates that somebody is ready to make a decision, or at least try something before they make a decision. If they're inquiring about a program that you know you don't really have a lot of leverage in in your area, it's not your strongest program, and it was a web lead, well, that's a cold lead, right? We don't... We, we don't typically sign people up in that program, and they're not calling us and they're not walking in. They're just, you know, taking 10 seconds to put some info in and seeing how we respond and seeing if we really want their business. So create a rating system and make no excuses about, well, I don't know enough about them to rate them. Do it. Okay. The next pitfall, keeping fragmented records of interactions with leads. What I mean by interactions are phone calls, um, the first time you talked to them when they walked by. Um, if, they, if they were on your website and they filled out a form and there's a little comments box, what did they write in there? You know, if they came in for an introductory, it went well, it went horrible, it doesn't matter. Those are the interactions that we must keep record of. And what I mean by fragmented is it's in several different places. So you've got to keep your communication history in one place. I know it's getting harder and harder nowadays, but ironically, that's why it's that much more important. In the old days, there were really only calls and face-to-face -face chats, right? Plus maybe the occasional mail out you would send. And yes, I'm talking about a letter, a paper, and an envelope. During this time, usually the only place we might track any communication would be our notebook, you know, that, that, that notebook that sits on everybody's front desk. And um, during those times at that rate, it was probably only the phone calls we might make note of, which is they call, and that was about it. You can't get away with that anymore. You have to keep all the information in one place, and you need details. Remember this. What you remember now, and you see I crossed out a day, you will forget actually in 30 minutes. There are so many things your brain has to process these days. We are the world of ADD, right? Your, your phone's going off, there's staff asking questions, there's students. I don't need to explain to you. You know you're busy. So just remember, all those conversations you say to self, sorry, to yourself, you're going to remember, uh, or you're, you, know, you think to yourself, yeah, no, I'll make sure I update my program director the next time I see him those often get lost. So you have to take some type of action within 30 minutes. Oh my goodness. From there came the school email address. This was the beginning of embarrassing situations. Example, uh, someone emails, I can't make it to the appointment today because of X, Y, and Z. Then that email isn't logged and somebody else in the school calls them and says, hey, aren't you coming down today? I mean, what, what type of impression does that make on someone who's considering working with us? We're saying we take care of every single student uh, as an individual and recognize what we need to do to help you in your path of training. Okay, so we say all that in our pamphlet, yet then we don't even communicate why they called in and said they couldn't make it or why they emailed in and said they could make it. Come on. You've got to keep these things consistent. Also, now with texting, I don't know if any of you give out your mobile phone or if you have a mobile phone assigned to the school so that members can text, but again, that's another thing that needs to be tracked all in one place. And then, of course, all the social media channels. Anytime someone responds to uh, a status update, anytime you get a message, anything that happens in social media, comment on your blog, take that information, copy and paste it, and put it in the login or that lead profile. It will help you so much when you're trying to contact them at a later time. Okay. So what am I saying? Each one of these channels act like a wheeled 
on your vehicle to drive better lead conversion. So think about those different channels. They're all acting as a wheel. If they're not connected to the vehicle, it's not going anywhere. Connect them to that one single vehicle being the way that you manage the information. Okay. Another pitfall. This is a huge one. Guessing when you don't know. Do not guess about your leads. What do I mean by that? Well, first, I have to say it. Martial arts business people tend to be some of the best psychics around when it comes to our marketing. Oh, my goodness. Hey, how do you know that this is working? Well, I just know. How do you know that this isn't working? Because um, it isn't. Okay, well, how many leads did you generate last month? About eight. You sure? Yes, eight. Okay, let's go through it. Hey, there's only six. Oh, yeah, but there's two I didn't write down. Okay, so you get my point. We cannot guess. This is your business. Get in the habit of researching when you don't want to. Or if it's not possible because you don't have data about your marketing, then get in the habit of taking the action so you don't have to face this problem of guessing in the future. The most common case of this, guessing on our market, again, it is or isn't working. What this does is it boils down to an oversight of the cost per lead. This is the cost you are okay to spend should you, um, pardon me, uh, I'm going to take a step back here and define cost per lead. Cost per lead is I spend $1,000 on a marketing channel, I generate 10 leads. The cost per lead is $100, okay? We can't have an oversight on that. We need to know what our cost per lead is for every single marketing activity we do. So if we're aware of that, we're not guessing. This is essentially what I'm trying to say here. Make sure you know your cost per lead. Also, a lot of people ask me, hey, well, what would be an acceptable cost per lead? What's the maximum amount of money I should spend per lead? It depends on who you are. It depends on your success rate in converting leads and the amount of time it takes you to convert those leads. If you can convert most leads within one business week and your success rate is 90%, then you know you might say the cost per lead that's acceptable is up to 30% of, of what your contract value is. I mean, if you're going to make 1200 on the contract and you know you're going to get that contract, in some cases I, I'd be all right to spend up to 300 bucks to get the lead because I can turn it into a, to $1,200. But depending on cash flow and depending on how solid I am on that type of confidence, I might step back and say, actually, no, 100 bucks a lead is kind of my safe point because I, I only sign up maybe 70% of them and it takes up to four weeks sometimes. So I do need to watch my cash flow. Anyhow, you get the point. Know your cost per lead. Determine what you're acceptable, or sorry, what you consider acceptable there. And make sure that you're auditing each one of your marketing activities so you're following that and making sure that you're within that parameter. Okay. Lastly, if you think in terms of cost per lead, you don't make the mistake of only analyzing the number of leads you generate. I mean, some people do this. They say, yeah, I generated 80 leads or I generated you know, only five leads. That doesn't mean anything to anybody, really. If there's a free marketing channel, like, meaning it doesn't cost you anything, and quote, unquote, it only generates you five leads, who cares? Your cost per lead is zero. Keep doing it. All right? Mind you, if there's another lead generating activity that you're in, you're like, yeah, I generated 20 leads, and then you take a look at it over the course of the year, and, it, and, and the cost is just completely out, out, out of uh, the boundary of what you're willing to spend per lead, is that a great campaign? So please think in terms of cost per lead. All right. Another pitfall. Acting as if people who don't sign up within the first one to four weeks never will. What do I mean? If... It takes me longer than my initial sales process, forget them, drop them, don't need to talk to them anymore. Let me ask you this, and you don't need to write in the chat box, just, just a mental question here. Have you ever been excited about buying or trying something, and then for whatever reason something came up? You know, I don't, I don't want to get into examples, but we've all been you know, ready and willing to either try something or buy something, and then we were interrupted. We can't ignore this. It also happens to the people we're offering lessons to. Here's some examples, and what I'm really trying to do is politely just get you to audit your own attitude here. If you are conducting any of the actions below, then you know that you are kind of following this attitude, and, and this is something I want you to change. So here's some of the actions. Not storing their info in a place everyone can easily find. It's, it's simple or not storing it at all. I mean, if you're not putting their information somewhere everybody can easily find, you're essentially suggesting that this person's never going to sign up and it's not important to track who they are because for whatever reason they didn't sign up in that first month. Okay, whatever. For those of you who use notebooks to store this information, and what I mean by notebooks is the, the, those little day planners that you carry around and, and sometimes they sit on the front desk. I, I, I know how you work. I actually used to do this. So please consider this. 
What would happen if a big cup of orange juice spilled on your beloved notebook? This could possibly be 